Well, across North America and around the world, case counts of COVID-19 continue to rise, as do concerns about the UK variant and other new strains of the virus. So how long until we can begin to see uh, the beginning of the end of this pandemic? Dr. Anthony Fauci is director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in the U.S. Of course, uh, Dr. Fauci, you need no introduction to the globe at this point, uh, such a, a regular presence on our screens and in our newspapers. Papers. Thank you for being with us today. Good to be with you. Thank you for having me. I do want to start with your current view of how much worse this may get. I know you have expressed the view that it could get a lot worse. What, what's your worst case scenario for the U.S. and elsewhere now? Well, I think we're going to have a pretty difficult uh, January superimposed upon the very difficult past month and a half that we've had since Thanksgiving. Uh, the numbers here in the United States are really stunning. Uh, we're, we have now over 350,000 deaths. We're averaging between 200 and 300,000 new infections a day. Hospitalizations are breaking records every day. We have over 138,000 people in the hospital right now. Um, it's really a very difficult situation. The reason we're concerned that it could even get worse than it is, is we still have not yet seen the impact of the travel and the congregating that you would expect to see during the holiday season of Christmas and New Year's. That usually, the effect of that generally lags by a couple of weeks after the end of the event, which was just last week with New Year's. So we expect as we get into January and maybe the second or third week in January that we may see these numbers even go up more. So it's been a very difficult situation, which is the reason why we continue to emphasize to people about the importance of maintaining the public health measures that we should universally be doing, wearing of masks, avoiding uh, congregate settings, particularly indoor settings, of gatherings of people indoors and keeping physical distance and washing your hands regularly. Those seem simple given the enormity of the problem, but they do work. What do you see as the biggest obstacle to containing the spread of this virus right now? Well, there, there are two things. Uh, there's one that is truly an obstacle, which is if we do not uh, adhere to the public health measures. We have a great deal of disparity in this country about adherence to the public health measures. We have certain areas of the country where even now, despite the numbers that are staring us right in the face, there are people that don't think this is serious. They think it's fake news. They think it's a hoax. They think it's just made up and exaggerated. The numbers are not exaggerated. They're real. So we've got to get an attitudinal change not in everyone. Many people are trying as best as they can to deal with this. The other issue is getting as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible, because the good news about all of this and the light at the end of the tunnel is that we have already two and soon to be probably more than two highly efficacious vaccines with a 94 to 95 percent efficacy and really quite safe. We've got to get people vaccinated. There are some people who still have skepticism about vaccine. We need to make sure everyone's on board that when vaccine becomes available to people in various categories, that they very willingly take the vaccine, because that will be the answer to this and the solution to this is getting enough people vaccinated that you get an umbrella of herd immunity over the country that would make right. the risk of being infection very low. There has been, uh, doctor, a huge optimism around vaccines, um, perhaps overdone given how slowly they will roll out. Are you concerned that they, the rollout won't be sufficient to either keep pace with new variants that may be more resistant or with the expiration of the vaccine among the vaccinated? In other words, is this so slow that we may run the risk of prolonging this uh, into a multi-year affair? Well, I think we better be careful about making judgments because the rollout of the vaccine has only been for a couple of weeks now and undertaking a vast uh, uh, endeavor such as this vaccine program will always have some bumps in the road and some hiccups, particularly when it was started right in the middle of a holiday season 
where you're not really operating on all your or cylinders. Yes, we are below the level that we want to be. There's no excuse for that. That is what it is. We've got to do better than that. But I would wait to see the first couple of weeks of January to see if we can get back on track. So I don't think that we're going to have situations where vaccine is going to expire by the time we get it into people. I think we'll be able to correct that. With regard to the variants, even though we are seeing variants and we're following them very carefully, at this point in time, there does not appear to be any inhibition of the protection that is afforded by vaccines on the basis of these mutants that are being followed both from the UK, and we have some of them right now in our own country, as well as the mutations mm -hmm. that are seen in the Republic of South Africa. Well, that is very good news, of course. Um, I, I'm curious, as we obviously you're still deep in this, uh, but what do you think is the most important thing we've learned since the beginning of this pandemic? Well, we've learned a lot of things. I think broadly at 40,000 feet, we've learned how much and how little you know when an outbreak starts. There were so many things that we did not know in January that we found out in February, March, and April. Uh, things that like the extraordinary efficiency of this virus in transmitting from person to person. The other thing that we did not know in the beginning, which has a major impact on policies such as contact tracing and mask wearing, is the fact that such a high proportion, 40 to 45 percent of people who are infected have no symptoms, which makes it really very difficult and problematic to do kind of the public health things that you need to do. Those are just a couple of the things that we've learned. The other thing that we've learned is a good lesson. If you're ever going to have a pandemic, it's, it makes it much worse when it occurs in the context of a very divisive society, which is what we have here in the United States. I think the election results, when you see how close they are, split down the middle 50-50 in some of the races that we've seen and the closeness of the uh, of the you know the, the 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 split in the country that often you have public health measures that almost take on a political context and that is really unfortunate because there's no room for politics when you're dealing with a threatening pandemic that's threatening the lives and the safety of people but that is what the situation has been i mean things like mask wearing have become almost a political issue mm -hmm. that makes implementation of public health measures very difficult. Are you hopeful for a change on that front? Because there's obviously a change in the White House and, and even potentially change over the balance of power of Congress in the Senate? Well, I'm, I'm not going to get into any of the politics of it, but I doubt that the divisiveness is going to change overnight. That's something we're going to have to work on to get everybody understanding and pulling together. One can understand different political and different ideological differences, but everybody has to pull together when you're talking about responding to a deadly pandemic as we are right now. Mm -hmm. We have heard from the World Health Organization that this, as bad as it is, may not be the big one. Uh, do, have we learned enough, in your view, to prepare us uh, and better position us for what could come and could be worse? Well, I mean, I think we need to, uh, first of all, concentrate on where we are right now. This is the worst that we've seen in 102 years. That's bad enough. Hopefully, when you go through an experience like this, there are lessons learned that will help you prepare for the next outbreak. I've said in the past decades ago, when people have asked me continually, what is it that I fear the most? What is my worst nightmare? What keeps me up at night? It's always been the consistent answer. If one goes back and look at the files, it's a respiratory borne illness, a new virus that we've never experienced before, likely jumping from an animal reservoir to a human that has a high degree of morbidity and mortality, either generally or in some populations, and that is very easily transmitted by the respiratory route. And unfortunately, that's the nightmare that has now occurred, and we're living through it right now. Hopefully, we will learn enough from this that we will be able to be prepared much better the next time we get challenged by a public health crisis such as this.